Hello, Legionnaires, and welcome to some Rando RPG livestream. Tonight, our panel of Dungeon Masters, Game Masters, Referees, Storytellers, and Players will share their diverse tabletop role-playing game experiences to provide ideas, suggestions, and possibly even some advice for your tabletop RPG sessions. I hope you're ready to take some notes. I know I am. So let's get started. All right, welcome to the Some Rando RPG live stream. I am John Maxley Oslo, your host, and I'm truly grateful that you are with us for tonight's live stream discussion on running a Halloween horror one shot. Let's get that off the screen there so you can actually see me read my script. Anyway, I sincerely hope you enjoy the conversation. So what do we do here on some Rando RPG live stream? Well, in segments one through four, we discuss topics surrounding the tabletop role playing game hobby with an emphasis on individual experiences, desires and expectations in tonight's Four segments on running a Halloween horror one shot. We hope to provide ideas, suggestions, and food for thought for your tabletop RPG session. Then in segment five, we let our hair down just to talk about nerd issues of interest. If these panelists want to remain, they can. If they want to head out, they can. We bring in other people. It gets crazy in segment five. You know how it goes. And if we meet the giveaway threshold, we will do that during segment five. So please consider supporting Legion of Myth through the links in the live stream's description. YouTube takes 30%. Twitch takes 50% of your hard-earned money. While Rumble, PayPal, Streamlabs, Ko-Fi, etc. take between zero and 5%. As normal, Rumble Rant Super Chats of less than $20 I will read at the end of the segment. Actually, it's at the end of the question. Whatever. I'm saying segment. Deal with it. <laughs> $20 or more, I'll interrupt the segment, read your rant or chat as immediately as I can. As always, I'm going to let somebody finish his thoughts first. And $50 or more, I will take a drink in your name, and you can force the panel to answer any tabletop RPG-related question of your choice right then and there. I will not get drunk on, your, on the stream, though. If we make $100 or more in Super Chats or Rumble Rants, there will be a $25 Plating Books or drive through RPG gift card giveaway during Segment 5. I wonder, is that a conflict of interest saying Plating Books today? Huh. <laughs> 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 what about that? We had, a, we had our $100 winner last week, and, and he went with Palladium Books. So, uh, But you can get it from Palladium Books or drive through RPG uh, if you are the winner. Legion Myth YouTube members as well as tonight's Super Chatters and Rumble Ranters have the opportunity to win, but you must be watching at the time of the giveaway to claim your victory, else it rolls over to the next week. Just want to remind folks, I don't know if you can see the boxes behind me, my cat's kind of in the way, but the Here Have Max is the final, the last forever Here Have Max is crap giveaway for our making five i mean six thousand subscribers now uh includes in nomine like all the books of in nomine uh, mutants and masterminds and star trek adventures you can look to the youtube community posts might have to scroll down a little bit or on our discord the to, uh, links to where you can enter for those contests remember they're used books but not that used actually those books weren't used much at all. Anyway, don't forget that Legion Myth moderators will time out or even ban people who attack any panelist or chatter. Attack the argument, not the person, and keep your various social media beefs off my show. And boop. Please like this video, subscribe to all the panelist channels found in the description. Actually, I'll get Baron in there in just a moment. He was a last minute ad here. So Baron, if you can, in the private chat, put a link to whatever you want people to be linked to, uh, that'd be awesome. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and support. All right, before we get started, the one last thing I want to say is uh, we unfortunately lost a panelist earlier. He was having the same technical issues that Heathen Dog's been having the last couple weeks, and it was unfortunate that uh, he couldn't be on. So we have Baron. Baron, thank you very much for taking for being the bench warmer that comes in and saves the day. Go, Rudy. <laughs> so thank you for being here. I appreciate that. And uh, let me read the super chat, and then we will get to the guests. And... Uh, Crafty Matt says, hello, Kevin, and whoever these other people on the stream are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so again, we're, we're nobodies. Kevin comes on, and, you know, it just elevates, like, all the viewership. <laughs> oh. Glad you think so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, with that out of the way, all right, okay, we'll start with uh, Lord Mattias here. Who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Um, well, I'm Lord Mattias. I got a YouTube channel. I'm on the mean, uh, Lean Mean Rumble Machine as well. I got a blog. Uh, I recently published a Wretched Room, or excuse me, a Red Room Wretched Verse uh, module called Isle of the Sapphire God. You can get it at the Red Room or at Giant Slayer Games. And I encourage you to go to Giant Slayer Games because they are an alternative to drive through RPG. And he's a stand up guy. 
uh, the owner that is. Um, I've been gaming since 1988, started with the red box set, moved to advanced Dungeons and Dragons. That's advanced, Mark. Advanced. And then I played some Palladium as well um, during the 90s. Uh, then I moved into some other stuff, but uh, um, I'm a big OSR guy now. And um, so, yeah, thanks for having me on. Okay, sounds great. Below him, we have the one and only Kevin Simbita. Who are you? I just mentioned your name, but you know, who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? And by the way, we're on a clock, so. <laughs> uh oh. Is he frozen? There what? Oh, there you go. Now we see you froze for a moment there. Now we just blinked out for a minute. But, and anyways, I, uh, I, I've written a few horror games, kind of supernatural, uh, kind of co-authored, uh, Nightbane, um, Dead Rain, the zombie game. And, and I've been a big horror fan for a long time. And, uh, I think what makes me especially appropriate for, for this panel discussion is I created a, uh, a fantasy horror one shot that I've run for the last 40 years. I probably have played the Lord the Silka convention tournament game i don't know 100 times 200 times oh wow so uh it's fun and uh yeah happy to talk about it and let me guess everyone is unique um fairly because <laughs> i mean every time you have different players you never know what's going to happen i mean certain things are, are the same but uh then you get that group that or that individual that just surprised the heck out of you it's, it's always fun and filling in, we have Baron G Rock. Sir, who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? I'm the guy that Max begged to come on. It's just, I was on my knees, man. <laughs> uh, Baron G Rock, uh, the, uh, formerly of the Table Breakers, which uh, we are in plans of bringing, resurrecting that here in the next few months. So stay tuned for that uh, with uh, myself and a couple others. And uh, I do a little bit of YouTubing. Okay. All right. Let's jump into our questions then. Uh, if I get the right, there we go. And we, of course, will start with a Lord Mattias. And our first segment is on setting the stage. So we're talking about the ambient environment and getting the players ready to sit at the table. So the first question we have is, how do you design the environment, the play area, so to speak, to evoke a sense of dread and anticipation in the players? All right. Um, I, I thought about this one a lot. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with, I'm a realist. I don't think you should, as a game master, expect to have your players at the edge of their seat for four to five hours, six hours, however long your session is. I mean, it's still a game. They're still your friends. They still want to eat their pizza, drink their beer, or if you're not old enough to drink, Mountain Dew. Um, so, But you should anticipate and plan for moments of dread where the, comp, the jokes die down and all of a sudden they're looking at you like, wait, what did you just say? You know, that you want those moments because those will be the memorable ones. So I'm not one to like, doll up the place and put all kinds of spooky stuff around but a buddy of mine that we play with really likes halloween so i usually schedule our game at his house so he already has <laughs> the the stuff set up like the, the whatever he's got going on in his uh, gaming room um and that kind of primes uh my players to kind of get in the headspace uh that it's spooky time um i also kind of look at things as you know you got one foot in the real world and one foot in the fantasy so um, when it's time for the actual play, you know, I tend to be a little bit more descriptive um, than I usually am. But in terms of just sort of like get the players, you know, it's like it's like a, preparing for like a Halloween party, you know, just kind of have some maybe dim the lights a little bit. I'm not one to have like candles and like I'm playing Vampire the Masquerade or anything. No, um, no seances going on? No, no, I don't go that. I'm not that into it. Um, uh, I think once players sit down and they're having especially if you got the right game you're you, to play um they'll get into it and they'll either have those nervous laughter of like watching a slasher film or that nervous dread if you're running like call of cthulhu or something like beyond the supernatural um where there's look like that more eldritch horror thing going on so 
how how do you do you even try to instill in them the dread again this is this is setting the stage now we're talking at the at the beginning uh i know you said you play at your friend's house uh but is there anything you do or is it really just hey this is another session we're just gonna doll it up a little bit because it's halloween uh honestly yes because i think okay. what matters is what happens when you actually sit down sit down and start rolling the dice like i again like i think maybe if you're dealing with younger players that kind of spooky stuff could work psychologically, but I don't think it's going to be like, if I were going to put some up like a percentage on it, having some Halloween stuff up, uh, dimming the lights might add 20%. I think most of it's going to be the interaction between the players and the game master. Once the game okay. starts. So you don't go all Tracy Hickman and have projectors and everything else. What I forget what <laughs> yeah. he said in XDM. <laughs> oh no, no, I, I don't, I don't make it a big production. I, I really don't. I, I don't think it's necessary. Cause like if, okay. if you got, like I said, if you got the right game, not all games can do it. Uh, but if you got the right game and you're doing the, putting in the, the right kind of work, you'll, your friends will remember. And they'll be like, yeah, that was awesome. Are we going to do it again next year? So, okay. That, that's fair. I'm glad I, I was not expecting somebody to come on with that perspective. So I'm actually happy you did because I love having people on that have a different take on this. So we're not all just saying the same thing. That's cool. All right. So uh, we'll drop down to, to Sir Kevin. Uh, same question for you. How do you design the environment, the play area, to evoke a sense of dread and anticipation in the players? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Lord M Mateus there. I, uh, I'm a big theater of the mind guy. So I've run my horror game in a totally bright convention hall um, where there's nothing scary other than, you know, the amount of food some people consume. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, if you set the stage right in their minds, you're, you're all set. Now, that's not to say that you can't have spooky music and all that stuff. I'm not one of those guys either, Lord Mateus. I don't do it. I uh, uh, I know people who do, and they've got this whole thing set up, and they'll, they'll have their whole soundtrack, and it will even be gauged for when this step happens, I hit it, and it, this music plays. And I'm like, I guess that's cool, but, you know, and I'm a music guy. I, you know, I, I love soundtracks, but... I don't think is necessary. It's it's about the story and the characters. And you, the minute you drag them into the the gaming environment, uh, that's once they're hooked, they're hooked, they're in it, and uh, they are yours. I, I really like because because I'm the type of person that maybe have an overactive imagination. So if I can visualize, believe it or not, I'm a guy that I don't like miniatures because I think miniatures ruin my immersion to some degree because I see the miniature and I don't see the character, but the more I can see the character in my head. So absolutely, I mean, I understand where you guys are coming from on this, where I don't need that stuff. Um, so can you share a time when the atmosphere of the room, whether it's from the players, whether it's from uh, the imagination, uh, the storytelling, but uh, where the atmosphere of the room, though, helped build the world, build the setting, build the session? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, in my very early days of gaming, we were gaming in this really spooky house. So it was kind of just scary even getting to our gaming room because <laughs> we had to go through like what what felt like a dilapidated attic. Uh, was the it, fear though the fear was less of ghosts and more of tetanus though, right? <laughs> well, that was there too. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about ghosts, but it was more like, are there rats here? <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I can't really think of anything okay. where the atmosphere was physical atmosphere did a whole lot. Not a problem. I, I kind of like this. We can just zip right on here. Uh, Baron G-Rock, uh, same question for you. How do you design the environment, the play area, to evoke a sense of dread and anticipation in the players? Well, it really depends on what type of situation you're running. Or if you're running a one-shot, uh, the, the setting up is completely different than you know putting it into maybe... You know, this time of year, you know, dropping it into an established campaign. Um, like with a one shot, one of the best ways I've ever 
had a, and I was a player, but you know, I've wanted to do this. I haven't had an opportunity was we were sitting at the table waiting for the DM to start. And he goes, okay, everyone take everything out of your pockets. And we all just kind of stopped and looked at each other like, okay. And we did. And he says, and, and you know, those of us who had backpacks brought them on the table. And he goes, okay, this is your gear. And at that point, it started the game as being a zombie apocalypse and within the game store that we were playing it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that right there, you know, it's one thing to capture the, the essence of the actual horror. It's another to actually take your, you know, basically you're taking yourself what you have available right in front of you and say, now you're in the game, not your character so much. Uh, now, as in doing it with like a campaign, you know, the thing is, is that leading up to it, you can drop little nuggets along the way to make people go, wait, what? What's going on? And you'll have those inquisitive players that, you know, kind of like what Max was saying earlier that, you know, really, you know, get really immersed. And I have found that it is much easier to create that by letting the players' minds just run wild. You mm. drop little nuggets here and there, and you let them set their own stage, and then and then you'll either they'll be like, "Wait, what? Well, that wasn't what I thought it was," or like, "Oh my god, that's worse than what I thought it was," because it's either going to be a real super high form or a. Mm, I didn't see that. Plot twist, you know, it's like, when did I get into an M. Light Shadowland movie? You know, what the heck? <laughs> um, you know, but 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 I have found that dropping the little nuggets here and there, especially in a campaign that you're actually running, tends to work a lot better. And then and then you just you know, at one point you just crank it up to eleven and and just roll with. I think this is the first time ever I've had three other people outside of me on a panel talking about either Christmas or Halloween where not one person said, Oh dude, you got to go all out. You got to get the tick tape. You got to put up spooky stories. You got to get the sound, the lighting, the ambience. All my follow-up questions were related to that. Uh, at least oh. the ones I kind of had prepared because I've always had, <laughs> even growing up, I always had at least one person that was like, no, you got to do it this way. You, you got to do the lighting and you got to put the music in three rooms away and you got to have a door slam. It's like, I don't need that, but okay. <laughs> go ahead. Lord Matthews. I was just going to say, like, uh, provide a little story. Years ago, this is probably like 20 years ago, I ran like a, a spooky Halloween thing that I plopped into my campaign. It was a vampire college, and, you know, the players had to figure out that the vampires were in there. And I was studying music at the time with my friends and that I gamed with. So I tried to do some of that stuff. We had the lights down. We had the candles and I had this little keyboard next, and I was like, you know, hitting the keyboard when dramatic stuff happened. And, I, and this is this is like a cautionary tale. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a friend basically crack open a beer, sip it, and look at me and go, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, this is actually ruining the ambiance." And I think to Kevin's point, and I think what Baron's getting at. The theater of the mind is where it is, and that's what you really should try to focus for. So if it works, I'm not, I'm not uh, an absolutist. If it works for you and your crew, you mm -hmm. want to, like, put on the, the cape, uh, the fangs, and go <laughs> have fun with it, man. Yep. Uh, hell, I might even have fun playing it. But if I'm running it, you know, we'll dim the lights a little bit, pass the beer around, have a slice of pizza, and then let the gore fest begin, you know? Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of those guys. Um, you know, it, it, and I've said this a million times, you know, role playing is very personal. So whatever works for you. And if you and your players are having fun, then you're doing it right and go for it. But, you know, every, it's different for everybody. And you, you go with what you have fun with. And see, a lot of people like to, you know, criticize the way that I run because I know point A and point B. I know where they're starting. I know where they need to get to. And I just make it up as I go along to get them to that point. And it, it, it is, I, I've actually been told that it's been the fun, the best experience people have had. I've been told that it is like, they're like, well, 
how, how can you not know how to get from how you're going to get them there? I said, because this is the this is the way that I explain it. Plans fail. Agendas can be changed on the fly. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. He's got that. You got that trademarked? Because if not, I'm writing it down. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Dang it. All right. Well, we got no super chats that time around. Is there any, any, uh, anything you guys wanted to address with each other before we move on to the next uh, question on that? That one was very succinct and, and quick, but uh, you guys are all on the same page on that one. So uh, I think we're ready to move on unless you guys have any final comments. Okay. I think so. All right. Again, no super chats. We'll just jump into the next question. And this time we start with Kevin. So what techniques do you use to introduce or build the atmosphere of the horror in the game uh, from the very beginning of the session? Well, I like to set things up where people don't know for sure what's going on, but something is afoot. And uh, I'll set things up with... Uh, I sometimes actually go very clearly with what, what, what the situation is. For, so, for example, of Lord Desilka, um, the setting is, is simply that this sort of despot tyrant who's been uh, the lord of this kingdom for an unusually long time. Uh, there's rumors that he's made a deal with the devil to be eternally young. Some suggest he's even immortal. And right away, as he's telling this, it's already getting people's minds going. And they're like, oh, what is this guy? And then I, I go on to explain, in this particular example, that... Uh, the rumor is, well, everyone knows he's, he's consorts of demons, but the rumor has been for several months now is that he's made a pact with some demon Lord of Hades in, in the case of my Palladium fantasy game, where he is going to become the new, a new demon Lord of hell. And if you don't stop him sacrificing, uh, an innocent, virgin by midnight in some horrible ritual that will complete what he has to do he'll become a full-fledged demon he's already more than human as it is and the entire town the kingdom and everyone in it including your player characters will be teleported to hell where he's a new kingdom of, of, of hades and you become his, his minions or his playthings to be tortured and whatever. And then I, I set up a specific time, like like all the other heroes. And I also explain how, in this particular example, how other heroes have come in to investigate and to stop this guy. And uh, they've been found hanging from trees, their heads on poles, uh, all this kind of stuff. And then the rest of the heroes have gone, to hell with this, I'm out of here. <laughs> His time is running out, and I'm not going to become a minion of hell. And so you guys are this kingdom's last chance, and you have two hours left. And I actually pull out a clock. Once I do the setup, like I'm just kind of giving here, I then put out a clock that they can see the whole time. And when the game starts, the time starts ticking. And <laughs> That really adds to the level of tension because, you know, they may be killing things and discovering all kinds of amazing things and, and freeing other prisoners, but it's like, shit, man, we don't know where Lord the Silk is, you know, uh, at ceremony is going. Where, where's this ritual happening? We've we got only 20 minutes left. We need to get our shit together. And that alone starts to create a whole sense of, of dread and worry and, and sense of urgency. Um, it's also funny too. And they're always right. When they say this, there's a point where someone goes, we got to quit dicking around with, with these minions. They're just trying to slow us down. They're trying to prevent us from finding Lord DeSilka. And it's like, bingo. <laughs> now, what are you going to do about it? Um, and then I have this great beyond the supernatural game that I, I've, one shot game that I played several times, usually at conventions where the, our heroes get the feeling that there's a, uh, uh, based on everything they hear and, and see that there's a uh, boogeyman at work because several children have gone missing. 
uh, ravens in my game hate boogeymen. They're just like a natural thing. So these ravens are like, caw, 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 and wherever you find the most of them, you know, kind of cawing and screaming out, suggests that you're somewhere near the lair. But is it a boogeyman? It could be something else. It might just be a regular, you know, pedophile or serial killer, or you don't know for sure. And maybe it's some completely different creature. But they, they, they go on that. And then the other thing to set things up that's really cool is, and it might seem like a cheat, but it's a one-shot, guys. Set up an environment that is instantly spooky for people. And a sane asylum is freaking great. Because people expect for it to be haunted and for strange things and terrible things that possibly happen there. Thank you, gazillions of horror movies, for setting that up. Uh, <laughs> you know, some ancient ruins, some underground. Hey, no one knew that this old subway system was still here. Uh, that works really well. Uh, graveyards work really well. Ancient ruins uh, uh, a church that uh, has been closed down, but had had rumors of something uh, demonic happening there. Uh, you know, go with the tropes that that work. Uh, did I mention swamps? Swamps are great. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, just because that's just going to get people into the groove. You know, very very quickly. You just answered the follow-up question I was going to give you, but that's okay. I have one that I thought up. Uh, how, do you pause that clock when combat starts? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> the clock never stops ticking. No, combat, It's a, especially, in, especially in my Lord of Silka game, I mean, combat's happening all the time because his minions are trying to prevent you from finding him. Okay. And that's the cool thing in my game is they don't have, in that particular game, is they don't have to kill Lord Desilka. They have to stop the ritual. So that could be preventing him from completing it. That could be uh, rescuing the victim, the intended victim. Um, you know, so I like to give my players options. Okay. Awesome. Baron. Same question for you. What techniques do you use to introduce and build an atmosphere of horror inside the game uh, from the very beginning of the session? See, Ke Kevin kind of hit on mine a little bit, but but I'm going to sum it down even better. Location, location, location. If you take, like, for instance, I'm going to use this for instance, because I ran a Vampire Dark Ages, mm -hmm. and I used Roanoke. Oh, you know, everyone died and everything else. Or and did they? Well, and then the vampires come in and they found out it was werewolves, Native American werewolves that killed everybody. Hmm. But now that the the second group of settlers have come in, now they have to protect, you know, their food supply and make sure that they, you know, are are able to you know grow and and progress and are there any that guys in this scenario at all <laughs> what are there any good guys in this scenario at all black and white it doesn't <laughs> quite exist in world of darkness fair, you know, fair, <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> you know it, it's subtle shades of gray so yeah the but you know using but using that type of location uh, automatically, because most players at your table are going to know the the in as player knowledge what happened in Roanoke, so that's already setting up the spook spookiness level for them because they're walking in and there's nobody there. Everything looks like it was just left, and you know the, the fires are burnt out. Food still on the table. I mean, it, it's doing going that that route with it, and you don't even have to necessarily use Roanoke for that. But using those type of things where they walk in somewhere and there there there's food left on the table, you know, fires are out. You know, uh, if you're doing uh, like a more modern, you know, uh, electronics are still on, radios are still playing, TVs are on, you know, and it, 
you bet those type of things are going to put, you know, in, in the player's mind a little at ease or not at ease. They're going to be on edge mm-hmm. and they're going to be looking around going, okay, this ain't right. What's going on? And, you know, once again, kind of going back to what I said before, then their imagination will run rampant with what are we, what's going on here? Alien abductions. Yeah. Yeah. Is it aliens? Is it, you know, vampires? Is it, you know, uh, evil wizards? You know, whatever, Uh, you know, cultists, whatever it may be. But the thing is, is that by the presentation and location that you present them, especially starting off, that is really going to set that stage and you can literally play off of the players by kind of using what their fears kind of are Mm -hmm. to kind of help you navigate through to get the story, to help craft how their experiences within the story are because a lot of times you know as game masters we don't we forget about their immersion within our game and where you know we set up everything is you know boom 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 but we you also have to take into account of well if if i set all this up are they going to take these little niblets of bait? Or are they not? Are they going to ignore them? You know, th- then you wind up being that that type the the type of GM where you have, you know, the I'm going to use this because it, it happened to friends of mine, you know, where they're going in to fight like a hundred handed one, and they use wish because he got stunned to keep him stunned, and then they just kill him. Well, that was supposed to be the entire fight for the night, and it's done in five minutes. So, you know, use 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 the the you know the location, especially if, if it's something that they can actually um, connect with. That's that's another big thing. Being able to have that connection to that type of place, you know, a hospital is another great one. A, a, an abandoned hospital is another great one to use because everyone can in their mind can picture a hospital because everyone has been in a hospital to see. And we've all seen those movies. (laughs) Exactly. So using, using that, those type of locations is like paramount. And then you can just build right off. So um, that's a twofer. You also answered your follow-up question. Um, I've got one that's going to be for all three of you in a moment. So uh, I'm going to just jump right up to Lord Mattias there, sir. Same question for you. Let me uh, read it, though, just you know, for the audience. So what techniques do you use to introduce and build the atmosphere of horror inside the game from the very beginning of the session? Um, I, I agree with, uh, you know, leading into tropes and location, location, location. I certainly agree with uh, listening to your players to, like, feed off of their psychology um, but I, I tried to like brainstorm some keywords here for, for what I see, like the, the similarities from one type of horror genre from to another. Um, cause I think what you're playing is going to influence what you should focus on. Like Call of Cthulhu is very different from James Radji's Death Love Doom, which is very different from Alien RPG. Uh, but I have mystery, uh, what I call the onion and I'll talk about that in a second, but isolation and vulnerability, I think, are things you should focus on. So, so all, so, so, alien, <laughs> like all of well, that is alien. <laughs> the mystery, the onion, I actually get from Call of Cthulhu because uh, they recommend that you actually start with your horrible truth and then you build off, you just put layers on top of it, mm-hmm. so the players can start peeling back that onion. I think the mystery will draw them in, especially so whether it's something they got to figure out, like where's the location of this demon lord, right, and stop sure. the ritual to. What the heck is going on here? You want that mystery. That's that hook that's going to get them in there, and especially when it's dangerous. And that's when I go into vulnerability. When I run a lot of one shots, I actually provide uh, the pre gens. And what I'll do is yeah. I'll hand somebody a like a fighter, and they might have like a 16, 17 strength from you know Dungeons and Dragons uh, setting, right? And they're like, oh wow, I got this awesome fighter with a two handed sword. He's got a seventeen strength. This is great. Well, the entire module 
is not going to be solved using strength. Like the, I'm going to actually flip everything on its head. Well, I think yep. that a lot of times in your normal games, you want to let the players have their strength and, and have that shine, that moment to shine. When you're doing horror, you want people to be vulnerable. You want them to feel vulnerable. So, so how do you maintain the character's viability in that case? Well, it's a one shot. My goal is to kill them. <laughs> so I, I I don't. They, they they don't have viability. They have to think outside the box. And it's watch a lot. I watch a lot of horror. Okay, I'm a huge horror fan. I think when you look at those um, movies, the hero has got to do something completely outside the box more often than not to survive. Um, sometimes it's it is a skill that they have. That's one that they don't typically use. Um, sometimes it's something that they just sort of think about and they figure out by observing the um, environment that they're in and put some put two and two together to find a way to um, you know beat the the villain, the monster, whatever. Uh, but I I I turn everything on their head. So like, yeah, you might have a fighter with sixteen strength, and he might be able to take on some of these minions. But at the end of the day, against the main boss. Mm -mm. It, he's going to feel weak and the same thing with like the smart guy maybe if you have a uh like um like call of cthulhu you got all these investigators mm -hmm. you know they're very smart erudite yeah you know, but they all go crazy yeah exactly they end up going nuts uh because of that you know um and they're going up against creatures that are beyond them right so they that that kind of vulnerability i think helps create this dread i also think isolation is a great idea um where they they can't just say, hey, let's go talk to this high-level NPC that we met to help us figure this out or whatever. Like limit their choices in that in that regard. So they're really sort of forced to say, okay, how do we solve this thing and get out of here alive? Um so that that's what I think you should focus on. Now, again, I think depending on what you're running, it's going to emphasize one over the other. Sure. Um, like Jason Voorhees, you're doing like a Friday the Thirteenth slasher slasher flick with your uh, excuse me flick with your friends. Um, you know, it's going to be more about going up against some ineffable crazy monster that's really tough. You know, that's able to just pop up out of nowhere and start hacking people to bits. Um, uh, versus Call of Cthulhu, where it's just going to be a little bit more of a slow burn, and it's going to be more about the mystery. Um, and one one last thing too, I wanted to mention as far as techniques, I I tend to get a little bit more descriptive than I usually do, okay. and I think um, visual is not as good as sound. Uh, what I mean by that is, I think a lot of us have been kind of desensitized based on what we see on TV and movies and stuff. Um, but where when I cringe the most at a horror film is the sounds, like when when some. When when Michael Myers is like you know, and I'm hearing, <laughs> well, no, no, I'm hearing. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you. Of the, of well, the, the visual meat. side of it, that's how I run my Ravenloft games. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That you want to talk about the meat, yes, <laughs> the sound of the meat, the squishiness. You want to maybe even talk talk about the smell of the blood in the air. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't really do visuals all that. I mean, I do do the visuals, but it's like I could go. Oh, there's blood everywhere. Okay. Um, but you smell like this iron, you know what I mean? You smell mm -hmm. the, the iron of the blood and, and you he, your feet are squishing on the pools of blood. I think that that helps with the immersion too. I, I agree completely. I was going to, when, when Lord Mateus was done, I was going to say exactly that, which is description and detail. Uh, and even little sound effects, which he automatically did, and I think probably most game masters do. Like, and you mentioned isolation is cool too. Like, if because inevitably somebody wanders off, or everyone wanders off in their own direction, you know, classic horror tropes that they just walk right into. <laughs> and, 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 and and I like to say, yeah, you you know, so they're like, what do I see? I'm like, and then I describe what they see. And, and sometimes I'll get real detailed about what, what's there, if it's important. But then I might say, hey, you're looking around, you hear, mm. like, what is that? And they're like, your guess would be it's the door opening. The door behind me? It could be. What are you doing? I'm looking around. <laughs> what do I see? Who's near me? Nobody. Your, your other buddies went, this guy went that way, this guy went there, the other guys decided to go check out something at the car or get equipment at the car. You're you're all alone. So do I see 
anything? No. But you hear the floor creaking. I do? What, can I tell where it is? Yeah, it's like just 20 feet to your left. And I don't see anything! No. And then I'll get into maybe smells or other things. And, it, and that, that ratchets is up the tension and the suspense and you know, questions about what, what you're getting. And then sometimes I'll just really mess with them and, and, and I'll do the classic, you know, guy like, why you pull back the curtain? What do I see? A cat leaps out at you. And it's like, <laughs> son of a bitch. It was just a stupid cat. <laughs> was it? You know, and it's like, uh, uh, uh. you know, was it just a cat? Is it, you know, that was the cat there, but there's really something else there that you're missing you know, play on all that stuff. And, and yeah, I like the details. I won't just say, yeah, the floor is covered in blood. No, I, I I'll, I'll try to describe, you know, oh, there's blood splatters here or there, or, or yeah, you see a body and, 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 and like, you know, can I tell what the cause of death is? Well, not from where you're standing, you know, and that kind of implies, Oh, I got to get closer, <laughs> but do I want to get closer? Okay with my 10 foot stick. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you want to, you know, you want to tap into all that kind of stuff because it really works and it's lots of fun. Um, Remember, we have five senses. Activate all of them. Right. Yeah, I, I just to kind of bounce off what Kevin just said, um, I, I I talk about, I also mentioned, like, or wrote down limiting agency a little bit. Um, we are going to get into player characters in the next. Uh, you know, I think I'll it's, wait for that. I'll wait for okay. that. Okay. Uh, also, visual aids. You know, I, I, I'm an artist, so, but if you're playing a game and there's a cool illustration, you know, you can see, you know, when, when they finally do come across whatever it is they're supposed to fight or one of the things they're, they're up against, you can say, yeah, you know, you, you, you pull away the curtain, you don't see a freaking cat, you see this. And that has a lot of impact too, because time after time, it'll be like, <gasps> I do. And it's like, yeah. And then I describe her, even though you can you can see her clearly what she is here. I'll describe how, yeah, the blood is running down her arm. And you smell this foul, weird, ozone-y smell and, you know, whatever. And, and, and it just really adds to the situation. And sometimes I let people know exactly what they're up against. And Eric Woodjick used to freak out about that because he was one of these guys who was really into mystery and puzzles and discovery. And you would have to figure all this shit out before he revealed anything. And a lot of times I'll be like, yeah, so this is Lord DeSilka. You can tell he's not human, and you can tell it's also a Halloween one shot because he's got a fucking pumpkin head, you know? And it's like, yeah, there's actually flames inside there and stuff. And, you know, you, you've heard rumors that, you know, a scarecrow is one of his minions, and he's got some kind of demon and at least one or two or three demons serving him. And there's rumors about a creature called moon glow and it kind of looks like the moon. And, and so they know what they're up against and, and Woodjig would be like, yeah, but it loses all the suspense. And I'm like, no, Eric, you don't understand. It builds up more suspense and tension because they know what they're going up against, but they don't know where. They don't know exactly what these things can do. They build and it all up in their own noggins. You got it. And when they face them, it's like, oh no, it's, you know, like, in fact, with Moonglow, it's awesome because I usually introduce her as, uh, outside when they're still outside trying to find the entrance to his underground lair. And it'll be like, yeah, you know, and, and, and inevitably there'll be someone, you, you know, going, so I'm looking around, what do I see? And I go, yeah, you see the full moon there and, oh, there's another full moon over there. What do you mean another full moon? Yeah, there's another full moon. In fact, this one's getting closer and closer. And it's like, what? It's getting closer and closer. Uh-huh. What are you doing? You know, I'm pissing my pants or I'm calling my buddies or I'm notching my arrow or whatever the heck. You know, it's use visuals, use that sense of tension and suspense. They're, they're all your friends. They're all your tools. Uh, and they work great. Okay. Um, I have one quick follow-up that, that I want to ask all of you. Uh, then we'll move on to Super Chats and uh, then the next segment. And that has to do with uh, 
how do you establish a tone with the player characters themselves for, in terms of introductions? Especially, uh, I think two of you, oh, Lord Mattias, for sure, you said uh, you, do, you do pre-gens. So how do you set the tone with the character introductions right away? Oh, well, um, they're obviously tailored to the scenario and the game. So when I was running a bunch of Call of Cthulhu um, one-shots on uh, Halloween every year, I actually connected each uh, one-shot to the one prior. So, like, I would yeah. end up – they would have – like, they're, the, the, the characters might be – related in some way to a character they played, uh, you know, about a year prior. Uh, but they're all, they all have a reason to be there. So okay. and this kind of goes towards like limiting agency. Like, so for Call of Cthulhu, I actually made a guy who was an insurance adjuster who was investigating a boat accident. And it would, the character, the player was like, this is the most boring character, but he was actually the most interesting because he was the one that found the, the deep ones. You know what I mean? So like, um, uh, so I, they have a reason to be there and they're set the, I don't want to put this They're They're not out of the ordinary. I actually like, I think one shots work better when you're using ordinary characters and you're not mm -hmm. using super characters and that's why i also like if you do have a character with a lot of strength i'm i'm probably going to limit your op ability to use that to overcome uh the whatever is happening um, okay so uh but yeah that's i i try to connect it to the plot like directly i don't it's not like oh hey you just happen to be here unless i'm decided to do like a teenage slasher film which maybe they are just happen to be at cap Camp Crystal Lake this Halloween night with Jason Voorhees running through the woods, you know. I got you. Uh, Kevin and Baron, do you guys want to uh, answer that as well? Again, uh, just how do you establish the tone of the game with regard to player introductions? If there's anything you do. Okay. Um, a lot of times, a, a one of the best ways that I've found is you have a uh, some type of benefactor that kind of brings these people together. And, you know, since you were chosen out of all the people within the city or within the, the, within the area, you all with your skills are specially tailored to take on this threat. Whether they are or not, it doesn't matter. But that's what they're told. So already now, now they're all like, oh, Okay, yeah, we're, we've got the upper hand. We got the upper hand, and then you know, it, 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 then then the 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 hammer comes down on the anvil, and like, <laughs> yeah, but here's what you're going up against, and they're like, wait, wait, wait we're supposed to do that one, what, what? And then you know, the other, and then once again, it starts building in their brains. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I love the yeah, but part. And you keep mentioning a character who's really strong, but it may not do any good. But that's the, sort of the beauty of that character. And in a modern game, I often have a, a character or two that are like gun bunnies. So they're like, Ch -ch -ch -ch, I got this, I got my shotgun and my, you know, you know, nine millimeter and my this. And I even got a fucking hand grenade, right? But is that going to do any good later? I mean, it makes them feel good. And that's sort of the fun thing is the guy who's strong or the guy who's loaded up. Safety air, blanket. You know, they're they're all confident until the shit hits the fan. And then they're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And that's that's a beautiful moment uh, in, in, in the game. And it's a memorable moment. Um, I, 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 I love that element of things. Um, I also love what you said, uh, Lord Mateus, about ordinary people. I love putting ordinary people in horror games. And, and in, in Beyond the Supernatural, a lot of them aren't exactly ordinary. They probably have psychic abilities or they're at least paranormal uh, investigators. Uh, Baron, you mentioned, you know, they have a benefactor. Or in, 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 in Beyond the Supernatural, it's not so much a benefactor as there's they're kind of united some of them are united through uh, the Laszlo Agency, which basically is almost like a self-help group where, you know, if the four of us were, were members of the Laszlo Agency, it's probably because we've all had past experiences with the supernatural. 
We know it's real. We know people need protection from it. And we're crazy enough to try to be those people to help them. But I, I, I love two of my favorite characters in, in my regular Beyond the Supernatural campaign. Uh, and I too have pre rolled characters. Although I like to have more than, than what my group, like if I have eight people in, in my game, eight or 10 people, I'm going to give them 14 character sheets so they can select what they feel really resonates with them. Uh, and, and it gets back to, uh, you know, some of our discussions on your show, Max, where it's like power, you need powerful characters and your, a lot of your characters are just uneven. You know, this guy's a, a wimp compared to this guy. And it's like, yeah, but you know what? Sometimes that wimp saves the day. Mm -hmm. And what and, are you going to shoot up if you're in the middle of a town? Right. Well, and, 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 and sometimes that wimp just has that right moment. I think I've told this story before, even on your show, in one of my Beyond the Supernatural games, it was great. All the really badass characters are all captured. And while the whole group is captured, I'm thinking this is it. They're, it's going to be a game where everyone dies. And, you know, I hate that because I, I don't try to kill my characters. The Lord <laughs> my and, and, and I'm like, that's it. They're all dead meat. And arguably the wimpiest character, an 80, an 80 or 82-year-old professor ends up killing the, 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 the big baddie because he goads him into telling him what his big plan, you know, the classic, well, you got us. You might as well tell us what your plan is because we're all dead anyways. And while this guy is talking, Professor Higgins puts his hand in his pocket. And he's like, I've got a fountain pen, pen, right, Kev? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, can my character put his hand in his pocket and slowly loosen the, the, the cap and, take it off and slowly pull it out. And I'm like, sure, you can do that. You know, even if the big baddie notices what's going on, it's like, what is, what does he care? What's this guy doing? He want his autograph before he kills him. You know, it's like, who cares? And he's like, yeah, I get it. And I, I, I hold it. And he's like, I want to plunge it into his, right into his juggler. Can I do that? I said, you can try. Rolls a natural 20. Sure, rips it so that it's like blood is gushing all over. This guy's minions are going, what just happened? You know, because they're very much just, just monstrous minions. They don't know what to do without their master. And, and all this guy who's like this, this terrible sorcerer who's calling forth basically Cthulhu, right? It's not a Cthulhu, but I mean a Cthulhu-ish old one and and they're all like, what do we do now? And he's just kind of like, oh, falls over dead. And, and, and of course, while the minions are all going, the rest of the group starts attacking and now they get the upper hand. And it's that beautiful moment in the game where, you know, every, the, the balance of power all shifts and now they've got the momentum and it was, it was great. And, and a little old 82 year old guy saved all freaking group. That's going to be on right. his gravestone now. Awesome. <laughs> we, need, we need to go into uh, Baron. If you got a quick one, go ahead. Yeah, the I think the other one that I have used, not necessarily in a horror, but kind of bring everybody together, and it actually, you know, it, it's a viable thing because you know Avengers did it. Is what I call the Coulson effect. You kill somebody that's close to all of them, and then all of a sudden. Boop, they're together and ready to go. Yeah, whether that's an NPC or one of the players actually gets killed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, not the player, the character. <laughs> player's character. <laughs> no, we, we kill, we kill players. Tomato. We kill players around here. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, can it really be Halloween and truly scary if you're not going after the players themselves? Just uh, food for yeah, thought. We're, we're breaking the fourth wall here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right, Deadpool well, does it. <laughs> the, in the next segment we're going to talk about crafting the plot but before we do that i don't have any super chats i know a couple people have asked some really good questions but we are in a little bit of a limited time here so i'm going to move on if you really think that they're crazy important to be asked please super chat them else i'm not trying to do this to fish for money or whatever but i do have to move on uh just based on the time frames that we've got so uh i'm going to do that now but i do thank you for them the great comments that are happening in chat right now but uh well, give us a couple. If you insist. 
Uh, <laughs> Crafty Matt says, uh, how do you get player buy-in to play a horror game if the players are unfamiliar with horror? Uh, it's it's easy. Everyone's familiar with horror. <laughs> Everybody's had their blankets over their head as a five-year-old. Si you yeah. got it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, everyone's everyone's afraid of the dark. You know what I mean? Like they've been afraid of the dark at least once in their life. Uh, and that's the fear of the unknown. And it's a one shot. So like the very least that that should be an easy sell. You know, even if yeah. they're like on the fence, be like, it's just for tonight. We'll get back to D&D &D next week or whatever. Yep. Um, and then you have fun with it. And, and um, hopefully it's a bloodbath because that's a horror show. You tell them you either, you're, you're either going to play the game or there's the door. That, that That's no. <laughs> I mean, that works. <laughs> I mean, if that's what you want to play. No, the, you know, and basically it's, you know, typically when you're running a one shot, you're going to know the people at the table anyway. Uh, unless you're in a convention type setting. And at that point, I mean, truthfully, they've signed up to be there. They have an idea of what's going to happen because it's in the in the brochure. And, you know, typically, you know, if, if you can get your group of friends to actually sit around the table and say, hey, we're going to sit around the table, roll some dice and have some fun and kill some bandits. Yeah, that's typically all you really need for for a lot of the folks who play RPGs to say, in. And I think, this. I think we're going to talk more about that in segment two or three. I can't remember which one, but we're going to talk about kind of adventure gaming versus uh, horror, horror gaming. I'm saying that also because Crafty had a follow up there, too. We're, we are going to touch on those points because I think they're important points to get to. Uh, just would hate to spill all the answers now. The other uh, another one's ordinary people give it a Stephen King vibe, which is good for horror. I mean, he's considered the master of horror or something, right? So I hear. <laughs> and then uh, there was another one that mentioned Alien. Where was that? Da -da -da -da. Somebody mentioned Alien. The stress mechanic? Yeah, there it is. Ron. Hey, it's good to see Ron. I don't think I've ever seen you on one of the later shows, Ron. Good to see you here. Uh, stress mechanic and Alien does <laughs> have does the work for the Game Master. Yeah, I mean, it, it builds it up. So even if you don't have, you know... I don't want to say good role players, but but immerse role players in that regard. That stress mechanic just adds it to the character, and you are thinking, "Oh God, please no face huggers, please no face huggers, please no face huggers," as you're rolling the dice. So I, yeah, I absolutely get that. So so, and that's funny because you know some people say it can't be mechanically done. I think Call of Cthulhu does it over the long term, and Alien does it for the short term wonderfully. And then then uh, the improved, if you want to call it improved, but because I'm used to it, but. Uh, the updated, what are, uh, Kevin, what do you prefer, improved or updated when it comes to horror factor, the way it way it's uh, it's built into the game? Now, it's a pretty endemic when it comes to the new Bestiary book, which I don't have. I still have the old one. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think updated, but okay. it, it is also improved, I think. <laughs> so, all right, let me uh, do, do where are we here. Boom. All right, if you think you have some presence and charisma, the ability to entertain and educate a good audio-video setup, unfortunately, our, our prim original primary guest today did not ha have a good one, and he had to bow out. But I appreciate – actually, no, I want to be honest about this. I appreciate him doing that. He didn't try to, to ham-fist it. So uh, thank you to him, and we will try to get him back on the show for another topic in the future. But that AV setup is important, free from noise pollution, and an interest in discussing tabletop RPGs in this format. Join the Some Rando RPG Livestream Discord. The link is in the description to stay tuned for future topics. I've already started doling out – don't have dates yet – doling out topics for 2025. I think you got about six months' worth of topics for 2025. So uh, you can come up with your own suggestions. You you know see which ones interest you, whatever, and you know sign up and help us get to know you. And maybe we'll get you on the show to talk about your experiences. And of course, if you enjoyed this discussion, please like this video and subscribe to all of the panelists' channels, which you can find in the description.